Uh, welcome, so we're going to call the um, meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. So I am sure there's probably some folks here who are interested in the parking garage uh, discussion. And uh, the short version, uh, so it was an addendum to our uh, agenda as warned, but <coughs> excuse me, but we're going to um, hold off on the substantive part of that discussion. But instead, um, I, I'd love to add a, a brief discussion about um, the process and a, p a potential committee uh, to talk about the, the facade, um, some cosmetic uh, issues. Um, if we could do that right after the uh, consent agenda. Does that sound okay? Great. Any other uh, changes to the agenda? And we will have an executive session after this. Great. Okay, so without objection, we're going to consider the uh, agenda approved. So general business and appearances. Um, so this is a time for anyone from the public to come and make uh, uh, comments or statements about anything not otherwise on our agenda. So, uh, and if you do come to make comments, and this is going to be true for any uh, comments uh, this, uh, this entire meeting, as is our tradition, is that we're going to ask you to hold your comments to two minutes, and Donna will be there. Um, now, I, even when she flips to, so yeah, orange is, you got one minute left. Red is stop, um, and I usually give people a little bit of grace with the stop, but I will interrupt you um, if you just are really keeping going. So, um, great, Steve. Do you have something you'd like to say? Not on. Sure. Is that two minutes per topic or? On <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <In> your case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One minute. Uh, so briefly, uh, an update on the Communications Union District, of which Montpelier is a member. Uh, we met last night, and it, they finally voted uh, elected a treasurer, et cetera. They, had, they finally voted to use the name CV Fiber, which is consistent with EC Fiber, our sister communications union district. Uh, they are working still on policy issues, and they formed a finance committee, et cetera. But what I want to specifically ask you all to consider is how Montpelier, Montpelier is going to be last in line the way that district is moving because Comcast is here already and serves all of our streets. But Comcast is not symmetric service, will not be symmetric service to meet the state statute. So I think Montpelier will have to be more engaged and more forceful if we are going to build fiber infrastructure here for Montpelier, which in effect will be the economic uh, aggregation which supports the rural areas of the district. They aspire to build the rural areas, but you can't do that without the customers in the concentrated areas. So I'm welcoming you and inviting a discussion on an agenda in the future to get into real nitty-gritty detail of what, how that would work and what would be required by whom. But don't count on this lay board of volunteers with no technical expertise with few exceptions to uh, um, uh, You know, one of the things that <coughs> might um, make some sense is if um, a member of council, I mean, I'd volunteer myself potentially, and either <coughs> you or Dan Jones or both to just have a, a, sure. a meeting ourselves to figure out like what maybe some potential steps are, yep. and then come back to council with some recommendations. Um, does that sound good? Yeah, sure. Okay, so you, you have my email address. I don't, but... I it's on the city website. Okay. Let's get in touch and we can... Unless some other... <laughs> I know I'm volunteering myself for this, but if anybody else... Now that you mention it, I can barely use the city's website because the search box won't let go and can't be deleted and it moves around and things are so slow. Well, we can and, talk about that too. <laughs> and every... Uh, looking for agendas, you end up at the videos page. And it, it's, it's not well... Anyway, it needs work. Talk about that off the record. Uh, secondly, I heard from other folks while I was doing reconnaissance around the parking garage issue, folks are confused on the issue of allowing non-citizen residents to vote on issues. People are thinking that, interpreting that to mean people in Barrie will get to vote on city issues. And I explained it, no, it's for people who live here who are not citizens but who are affected by the city's services. But I think you all need to get that message out much more clearly if you want to informed support uh, or 
informed decision making on that. Fair enough. I mean, this is uh, um, uh, by petition, so we'll pass that feedback on to the folks who are uh, organizing that. And it's because it's not on the pending parking garage issue that is before you, I'm going to ask all of y'all to take administrative notice to the plans that were done in 2016 by some unnamed private developer for the pit and hotel at that location, because that is much more worthy of our consideration and our future vision for our city than the one that shall go unnamed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Okay, moving on. Uh, so onto the consent agenda. Do we have a, a motion or anybody like to pull anything? Yes, Jack. I moved the consent agenda. I sent the clerk uh, an email last night with a couple of other typos from the minutes. Um, you did? He's looking kind of confused. <laughs> um, um, well, whatever they were, I would suggest approving him with those corrections. I don't see them. I'll find them, though. Is that is that your motion? Yes. <laughs> Second. Great. Any further discussion? All, right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. All right. So we have a number of appointments to make. So the first up is the Complete Streets group. Um, and so uh, as we generally do, if there is anyone oh, oh, I'm sorry. We were going to do the parking garage thing. I just forgot right immediately. We're not going to do that yet. Okay, so um, actually I feel like I should turn this over to Bill. Yeah. Uh, we had laid out a process where we were going to try to select the, no, no. <laughs> we're going to try to select the structure tonight and then look at design issues coming up next week in order to have a full uh, decision ready to go for after that. We've been getting information from our architect. He's feeling like we're not, that there's a couple of things he'd like to research more before we can make a real recommendation. I mean, obviously, the, the, what it really boils down to is a four-story ramped structure or a five-story structure with some flat um, parking. The idea of adding, uh, making it so that it can be converted to another use in the future is going to add significant cost. The idea of planning for a roof is going to add significant cost. So I think those are all issues we'd need to work through. But those are essentially the two structural costs. The original plan had been to create a committee to then meet with the architect next week in a public session to talk through facade issues. One option, and he is amenable to this, is that either the whole council meets with him uh, and with nothing else on the agenda and discuss the structure and the facade or continue to have a committee that does that. Obviously, it's open to the public. Anyone else can attend and then have that recommendation go forward the, f the following week. Um, but so I think that's really up to you how you want to proceed with that. Happy to answer any questions. They do have some good information. You know, he's dealing with a third party, the uh, parking garage consultant who's also providing information. So. so my sense is that we uh, should see if there are folks who are interested in serving on um, a committee that would uh, deal with uh, either f just the facade or the structure. And then if there's more than three folks, then we can schedule a, a meeting. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, would anybody be interested in s um, serving on such a committee? We got one, two, three, four. Well, I'm interested, yeah. but I have limited time next week, so it okay. may be that others should just do it. <laughs> okay. Um, I would also be interested. So uh, are you two uh, amenable to like if we had a, if we just called a, a special council meeting just to talk about this? And again, it would be open to the public, welcoming, you know, input. I, I, am, I am open to that, but I also want to be clear that I think public input is critical to this decision, and I don't want it to be a decision where three council people meet and sort of talk about it, and then I, I want there to be a public input piece because I think I mean, y'all know how I feel about this, but uh, the fact that I'm willing to like be at the table, I mean, I think is important, and I think that getting other people involved in the process is critical, and that's the only way that I'm willing to participate is if there is a meaningful opportunity for public input um, about this. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'd say that was exactly what we were hoping to accomplish by having the meeting in a public setting where people could comment, and you know, the council ultimately has to make a decision, but they need to get the input from people rather than having a committee meeting in a private room or something like that. So we have it is with open comment. 
I guess it just strikes me then that it should be a council meeting in this format rather than something where only part of the council meets because yeah. I, I just, that's, I, that's fine. I actually prefer that. <laughs> yep, I, that sounds great. So um, one possibility is that we could um, try to find, like coordinate our schedules now, but that, uh, another possibility is that we could just save that till the end and then we can publish it. But I don't want to be, you know, I'm not trying to like do it. We do a doodle poll and we all respond like, tonight and or take like two minutes during a break I don't know I just I, I think that's really important for the public to know when that meeting is going to be agree. so they can reach out to us is, and let's start with next Wednesday let's just yeah see if we can yes. 19 see can if call. we can do it you can call in no. um sorry that was a no for Connor oh Connor can't okay. do it call in for Rosie oh, we could so if you have there. opinions we could you know just yeah. let us know um, that's uh, what that was a thumbs up for, you're, you're gonna call in unless we wanted to aim for I mean we have a meeting on the 26th anyway Ashley, well, I think the, so the issue with yeah I think the issue is timing is would be to try to get if possible we're supposed to have permit stuff filed by the 21st so some mm -hmm. some basic decisions would be helpful next week yeah well let's shoot for the let's shoot for the the, the 19th 6.30. Okay. Done. Special meeting. Special meeting. 6.30. Reparking garage only. Great. Okay. Thank you. Got to get back to where I was. Okay. All right. So we're moving on from that. Um, we said 6.30? 6.30. Yep. Okay, so uh, we are up to uh, Complete Streets uh, appointments, and uh, I think there are some folks here, at least one person here, I think, from um, who's uh, looking to be on this committee. So if you uh, are one of the candidates uh, up for this appointment, if you wouldn't mind coming up and introducing yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about why you want to be on this committee. Webster. Uh, the Complete Streets Committee probably has a name that's not always fully understood, but it was made up originally of pedestrian committee, bicycle committee, and um, some of us believe in Complete Streets, so we picked that name. Um, I'm really pleased, I hope, we have some more appointees because one of the troubles with this committee was that we had too few members uh, in terms of doing all the work we wanted to do. In terms of my qualifications, I've been working on sidewalks for a long time and walks and just do scrambles and various things to encourage walking. And I'd like to continue working, but I'd like to help. <laughs> so this is, oh, anyone else? Okay. Uh, so this is a committee for which we advertised six seats and there were four applicants. So one hypothesis is that we don't need to go into executive session. I would move that we appoint the three people who applied. Uh, four, Gary, the four, four people. people. Sorry, okay. I, might, am I, on, I might be on the wrong one. Back that up. I don't want to say the wrong names. <laughs> it's on the right one. Um, I would move that we appoint Gary Holloway, John. Uh, yep. That's John Snell. I'm mm -hmm. still getting used to the new application. John Snell, Teresa Thomas and Harris Webster to the Complete Streets Committee. A second. Um, I want to be clear about one thing. There were some, the terms, which terms? I mean, there's, uh, th there is a vacant two-year term. There are two. There's two one-year terms open and one two-year term open. Why don't we do them all of the two years and leave the one years vacant? Fine. That's OK. That's OK. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, all right. The Historic Preservation Commission. All right, so if there's anyone here who uh, is up for that one, if you wouldn't mind coming up and introducing yourself. <laughs> Good 
Hi. Hi, it's Jamie Duggan. Um, I work at the Lamont Division for Historic Preservation. I've uh, been on the committee for 10 years, the commission for 10 years, and hoping to uh, finish, get to the finish line a couple of projects that have been a long time coming, in particular uh, working on the design review process as part of the zoning hearing. So, um, but uh, there's a lot of other good things to that uh, we've been doing, and so just asking for a reappointment. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay. And Eric. I'm Eric Gilbertson. I've lived in Montpelier for 43 years. I've been a historic preservation professional for 45 years. And uh, I, my main object is in the, being on the commission is to complete the rules and guidelines, the new rules and guidelines for the Design Review Committee. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, I will again make a oh, motion. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Oh. Well, there's an amendment. Oh, somebody else wants to talk. Yeah. Oh. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I'm Bob McCullough, and I have worked in the field of historic preservation for about 40 years. I'm a former member and chair of the Design Review Committee. Uh, I have been away from city activities for more than a decade, and I think it's time to return. Great. Thank you. Any questions? All right, and I think there's at least one other person who uh, applied, so if the other person's here. Okay, uh, Donna. I just wanted to clarify, I spoke with Jamie shortly before the, the meeting started, and there's actually four vacancy. One person uh, oh. resigned bef after the advertising, so even though we only advertise for three, we have four seats, okay. so we could appoint all four of the individuals that applied. Fantastic. That was what I was going to move. Fantastic. You go right <laughs> So ahead. I would move that we appoint Jamie Duggan, that we appoint Judith Ehrlich, that we appoint Eric Gilbertson, and that we appoint Bob McCullough to the four vacant two-year terms on the Historic Preservation Commission. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? It's all to your terms. So, all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your service. Um, I'll point out. Yeah. I'm no relation to Mr. McCullough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Disqualifier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The community fund board. And I know there were two people who were up for appointment that. Uh, sent us messages that they couldn't be here and, I, and there's a there's a third person I'm not sure if that uh, third person is here no okay uh, so since n none of the three are here um, and there are three people for two seats I would recommend that we go into executive session uh, for this one so uh, I have a motion to that effect do you want to do I move we go first? oh d what's the next one social you have enough no, I that's think true. that's a. I, I think there are enough seats. I believe the committee um, voted to have up to nine members. I think there are still more. Applicants. Yeah, there was there were five applicants for four seats. So both okay. in the same executive session. Oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. We could do those both at the same time. Um, so uh, for the uh, social and economic justice advisory committee, um, there were five applicants for four seats, so any of those folks here? Yeah, come on up. Hello, I'm Victor Budagno. I'm a six-year resident of Montpelier. I have a daughter and wife, and we live uh, just up road. And I'm the president and founder of a small nonprofit called Great Blue Eco Media, and advocating for environmental and social justice through film. So I'm looking for a way to get more involved locally with the council. Great. Thank you. Okay, I'm in the whole world, um, eight year resident of Montpelier. Um, I'm not sure that I'm qualified, but I do have a, uh, I have another very limited income, so I would be 
had a grasp of um, the needs and challenges of people such as myself. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for either of these folks? Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, so I think we could probably go into executive t a session to talk about uh, both of these appointments. So do we have such a motion? I move that we go into executive session for purpose of uh, considering uh, appointments to uh, board. And I meant to get out the uh, Community site. fund. Uh, Community Fund Board and the Social Act. Right, but I meant, oh. I meant to get out this particular statutory oh. section. I don't have it out in front of me. Can we get that added to our um, cover memos for these? I feel like yes. we struggle with it every time. True, if you just say under statute. Pursuant to Vermont pursuant statute. Pursuant to statute. Yeah. It's, it's to title, somewhere in Title I. But <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll second that. Okay. okay. You, you were done with your motion, Jack? Okay. Yeah. So we got a second. Um, all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, we will be right back. Okay. Do we have a motion to come out of executive session? Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Great. So we have a couple motions to make here. Uh, Sorry, am I going too fast? No, no. I'm, <laughs> just, I'm, I'm a little slow. Uh, I move that we appoint Christine Zakai and Judith Sturmer to the Community Fund Board for terms of two years, th three years. Uh, Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, and we just want to note that uh, the third candidate, Renee Bordeaux, had also expressed interest in the investment committee, uh, and we're hoping to make some appointments to that committee pretty soon. So just want to make a note of that. Um, and for the uh, Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Yes, so I would move that we appoint Lalitha Maligawanam, Mark Hughes, Rebecca Tomaszewski, and Neville Burrell to the Social and Economic Justice Committee. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, and we want to thank you too, Victor, for your application. I hope that you actually uh, do attend um, some of these meetings. We want to welcome anybody um, from the public to uh, go to those meetings. And um, yeah, we welcome all that input. So thank you so much. And uh, okay, we're going to move on. Great. Um, okay, so um, the begging ordinance repeal first public hearing so the first thing I'm going to do here is open the public meet hearing mm -hmm. public, <laughs> public hearing um, so uh, I guess we'll s uh, what I would love to do is um, actually I'm curious if, could I just see a show of hands is anybody here from the public to speak on this or interested in speaking on this okay great um, uh, since there's not a lot of people here to speak on it, um, I might invite um, some public comment first, and then um, and then we can opine if we want to. <laughs> Should we have Bill give a little? Do you want to do you want to talk about it? Sure. I think this has been um, we've had a lot of coverage in this in the press and in uh, other media, but essentially the city's had an ordinance in on its books since 19. About 71, I think, and we have not enforced it for a long period of time. Uh, my people, along with several other communities, uh, received a request from the ACLU to undo this, since it's uh, essentially unenforceable based on court uh, court uh, decisions. Uh, our analysis is that we agree with their summation. I know uh, Brattleboro just re uh, removed theirs this week, I think, as well. So it was on uh, the agenda for first we did two readings to repeal this section of the ordinance. Great. Uh, so we'll start with comments from the public. Yeah. Hi, Bethany Pombard, District 2. Um, I just wanted to say I support the repeal as to hear, just to hear what uh, the community might say, and I'm glad that the city council is leaning towards repeal. Thank you. Yep. Uh, anyone else? Steve, did you want to say anything about this? <laughs> no? Okay. Oh, Y'all are on the right track. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody want to make a comment about where they're at with this? I mean, we don't have to. We can 
sure. keep we can cruise right through. But yeah, go ahead. So these these laws have been unconstitutional for a number of years at this point. So it, it's it's unenforceable anyway. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. Um, I would like to point out, though, that this is a bigger conversation that we need to have with Montpelier. I follow Front Porch Forum religiously. <laughs> Um, and uh, while not an active poster, I'm an active reader, uh, and I was really disheartened to see some of the patently offensive commentary from community members um, about folks that were panhandling in downtown Montpelier. And I even hate the term panhandling. I think that's offensive as well. So I am making a conscious effort to not use that. I'm just using the framework that was presented. Um, but I think that this is a bigger conversation that the city of Montpelier needs to have. And it's not just about the unconstitutionality of these ordinances. It's about actually putting our money where our mouth is and being the community that we want to be. And us repealing an ordinance is great, and that's fine, but that's not actually going to change attitudes and perceptions about poverty and poverty-related issues. Uh, and I, I just want to be clear to the council and to everyone here that um, repealing this is a no-brainer. It's unconstitutional anyway, but that if our work stops here, we aren't doing our job. Thank you. Further comments? Jack, go ahead. As soon as we got the uh, email from the city manager saying, we've got this communication, you know, my immediate reaction is, well, we ought to put this on the agenda. We ought to repeal this. It's, uh, it's, and it's not because of the threat of being sued. It's because it's, it's just wrong. It, people are, are very clear that uh, it's, it's a social ill that there are people in, in our community who are homeless or who uh, who don't have enough uh, to live, but uh, you don't fix that problem by uh, passing a law against it. You know, we we don't want people's houses to burn down, but we they haven't responded to that by uh, passing a law against having your house burned down. We uh, want to be sure that uh, we have the uh, social supports in place so that. Uh, People don't need to be out on the street. And I, I'm happy that we're moving forward with repealing the ordinance. Great. Anyone else? Go ahead, Tom. question. Any, any way to suspend rules and just put this to bed? I think it's unconstitutional anyway, so we can't even enforce it. So I don't, I don't even know procedurally if, if having a second hearing is required if it's unenforceable. It's still an ordinance. Yeah, yes, Donna. Just like several things that Rosie's brought to our attention, it's in our ordinance, so we need to officially take them out. So let's take them out and yeah. do what we need to do officially. I see virtually no support for it if we're able to do it tonight. It's well, I think the process requires two meetings. Yeah. So. Isn't it repealed by implication, though? Yeah, it is. But you still need to, if you want to take it off the books, you should yeah. just take the steps and do it. Yep. Um, I just want to observe, oh, unless you had something, Donna. No, I, I just was wondering about the date for the second hearing. If we need a motion, would we just that do it at our next meeting? meeting? Yeah, I mean, the, meeting the next. Oh, you could so what, you could do it at the special meeting. You just do it at the special week. meeting. Well, when we close this, the public hearing, we'll set a, a date. Um, so I would just observe that um, uh, since this has come up, I've had a number of really good conversations with some people in the community about um, uh, homelessness and begging in the community. And I'm really grateful for those conversations. I think that that's, uh, that's it's really helpful. Um, to, to be able to have a framework uh, for those conversations. So, um, uh, yes, Steve, and then we'll move on. I'll be brief. Uh, I've been on both sides of this issue. I've been a bit benefactor of folks, and I've had to ask for food and shelter before. Uh, lived in the back of an unheated garage on Elm Street for a while. Um, I would encourage you, since you are required in order to repeal the thing to have two hearings is what I'm understanding that we don't just repeal it and kick the can down the road for our initiatives of what we're going to do there's there's support that could and should be designed for the people who are uh, chronically uh, under resourced um, and it's not sufficient to just say, you know, state social services will take care of it. Uh, there could be, we could use this as an opportunity to design some of that outreach and figure out who in the community is going to make these people aware of where they can wash up or where they can get to a telephone or where they can uh, 
ask for some job training or whatever it is. That by basically repealing it and saying, yeah, we need to someday do something, we're missing the, the nexus, the, uh, the motivation. So possibly before you have your second hearing, you could use it as an impetus to get something else in place. Uh, Jack. I like what Steve had to say. This seems like something that uh, would be within the uh, ambit of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. We've yes. got uh, uh, the committee fully staffed up to nine members plus council representation. I think rather than wait any longer than we absolutely have to to repeal this ordinance, ask them to look at it. I'm sure they'll e be eager to do that. I put it on the list. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, so we don't need to. Um, Should vote to pass close, first reading. Oh, close, close the, the hearing. Close, close the hearing. Pass and then, first reading okay. and set the date for second hearing. All right, so I guess we're going to do that. So I'm going to, uh, assuming no one else has any comments. Uh, all right, so I'm going to close the public hearing, and uh, so we need to uh, vote to pass first reading and set the second date for the next meeting. Yeah, next week at the special meeting. Just looking at yep. the agenda for the 26th, I yep. would say yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's going to be a long discussion long. either date. So, so we need, I think we need a motion to that effect, right? Yes. I, I move, move that we pass on second reading and first schedule reading. this, or pass first reading, yep. uh, have it read the second time on at our special meeting next week. Second. All, uh, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so uh, wayfinding. Welcome, Dan. Should I move? I should probably move. Are you going to join me up here? Yes. Okay. And so is Corey. Oh, excellent. Hi, Corey. None of these are What's the path? It's kind of right there. Oh. That's right. Is this your laptop? No. Oh. Come on. P. S S W. That's a zero, right? Oh. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Introduce or do you want? Okay. 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 Let's figure out how to get here. Okay. Okay. I've never liked the sliding kind. Hate these. Thank you for your patience. Shit. Four minutes? You know, he was working before. I know. What's next? Is there an IT guy? I can get my laptop. Uh, can you, you want to go zip over again? Um, well, or someone. Can you take like a three minute recess? Because this isn't working. So, someone. And council person, Mayor Watson, can you take like a three minute recess so I can grab my laptop? This isn't working. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm just to say it from here. We're going to take a three minute recess. <laughs> Uh, since we're all here, we're going to end our recess. And uh, Dan, take it away. Can, um, John. All right. Um, I'm Dan Groberg. I'm the executive director of Montpelier Live. Um, and we are here today to present, um, essentially in final form, the bones of the Wayfinding Master Plan. Uh, the plan was approved this morning by the state uh, TIC committee. Um, and what we are asking for from council is your approval to move forward with uh, the plan so that we can go out to bid and to uh, fundraise any additional 
funds that we need to make the project happen. Um, there uh, is specific, specific messaging and things that are referred to in this plan um, that can still change after this point um, and may still change after this point. Um, but we're looking for your approval of the overall plan. Um, I'll say a few more things. One is that uh, John made some changes to this PowerPoint this afternoon, but we were not able to get them up uh, here. It wasn't working correctly. So there's a couple changes we made, such as Mess. Kellogg Hubbard Library being spelled wrong, um, that you will see in here that will be correct <laughs> before there is a sign in the ground. <laughs> um, the timeline. Um, our uh, hope and intention and goal, uh, obviously anything can change, um, is that we will apply for the Downtown Transportation Fund grant um, in early spring of next year. Uh, and if that is successful, we will be able to have uh, wayfinding up by the end of next year. Um, it's our hope that we do not need to ask council for additional funds, but I cannot make any promises. But I can tell you that we're not asking for any funds tonight. Uh, we're hoping to use um, some funding that's already set aside in the CIP for downtown projects and some other uh, funding we have available in addition to the uh, grant that we hope we get and our understanding from the state is that we will be strong candidates for that grant um, in the spring. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to John Seeley from Surface Matter Design who has been our consultant working with us on this plan. Thank you, Tim. Hello. Um, I'm John Seeley. Uh, our firm is located in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, surface Matter Design, we specialize in wayfinding and informational graphic systems for municipalities, for developments, um, cultural institutions. And uh, it's a very broad range of clients that we work with. Um, we've been involved with Montpelier Alive and the wayfinding design committee from Montpelier Alive for two years now, starting just about two years ago. We came up here for the first time and did a tour through Montpelier. Uh, we've gone through um, a fairly exhaustive um, audit uh, of all of the existing signs in uh, Montpelier as well as understanding the circulation both in the pedestrians and vehicles, um, understanding the, uh, uh, the entry points into and around Montpelier, um, identifying the moments of arrival and starting to put together a recommendation of sign elements and wayfinding devices to help uh, welcome visitors to Montpelier and also reinforce all the wonderful destinations and things to do here in uh, Montpelier. So what we're going to be showing you tonight is a cohesive master plan that shows all the kit of parts that goes into this system how they perform, how they look, how they're designed. Um, we, as Dan just mentioned, we have started preliminarily looking at messaging, um, and some of that is um, still going to uh, morph and, and, and finalize itself over the next year um, as we get into production. Um, but this is a, uh, I would say this is, um, this is a design development um, exercise, and uh, there, we would love to hear comments, um, and we uh, we'll go into what the objectives are here. You know, I think we can all understand that visitors do um, have certain frustrations here in terms of arriving, knowing when they're here in Montpelier, finding parking, getting oriented. Um, and so this system is really meant to make them feel comfortable and make the community feel holistic in terms of a sense of place. So a cohesive design signage system kind of brings that all together. Um, and that's been, that's been proven in a lot of communities. Um, we need to establish landmark, uh, uh, Montpelier is a landmark destination. So uh, the idea of really promoting its cultural institutions, it being obviously the state capital, there's so much here for um, tourism as well as visitors and residents alike. Um, and the science system will help kind of promote that. 
uh, awareness in the community, reinforce a sense of place. We'll do that through design. And I'm going to show you how we attempt to kind of create this sense of Montpelier in the community through the design. Um, and then this idea of scaling it in the future for future expansion um, into other neighborhoods potentially or with the new transportation center that's going to be developed, other uh, destinations that pop up, how do we include those new destinations into the system and let the system grow over time. So this is the essential kind of bones that Dan is mentioning. It's, about, it's really just a kit of parts that starts with um, identifying a, you know, the major um, arrival point um, at Montpelier with a landmark and then giving really solid and reinforcing wayfinding throughout, both for vehicles and pedestrians. So getting people to parking, getting, to, getting them to the right um, area in Montpelier after arrival, and then on foot, how do we orient them and get them to their destinations or just to explore? Um, and we do that through some parking identification signs and direction signs, as well as an information kiosk. Um, so these are really just diagrams that just show the, the bare kind of elements of the system. Can I ask a question? Uh, sure. That's the only place I Mike, saw. Donna. <laughs> Excuse me. This slide is the only place I saw the big kiosk that at one point was like a granite. The, the this entries. is just an example of the types of signs, and you'll see the design of the kiosk later in the presentation. Okay. But that wasn't changed? That still remains? Yes. Correct. Yeah. You'll, you'll, we'll, you'll, we'll get there. If we'll you don't have an answer, we'll there. there. In the attachment. Okay. It's, yeah. Uh, Okay. So consider these diagrams and everything after this design proposals. Uh, the, the hierarchy in terms of how we name destinations um, on the signs are very important. There's Vermont statute that requires all messaging only to be um, include uh, nonprofit organizations and cultural destinations. So that leaves off businesses. But we include the businesses with the kiosk and ways of listing businesses um, uh, in, in the uh, pedestrian system. Um, so we have this broken down into districts, public spaces and government, nonprofit institutions and culture, and shops and restaurants, which we're not naming by name, but by graphic symbol. Um, another part of this in terms of creating a sense of place is relating to the, the strong work that's been done by Montpelier Alive um, in the branding of Montpelier from a visitor um, uh, perspective. Um, how the logo kind of extends itself into a pattern and the typography and how it's used visually, um, we want to pick up on and make it part of that system. So we do this through um, taking that icon of the, the capital, um, as well as the pattern language that comes out of that branding exercise, and we use that as the back of the signs um, for the vehicle signs, as you see right in front, um, and then also in the kiosk and the pedestrian signs. So this is a sort of a visual um, family of signage that starts with the vehicle uh, directional signs front and back, the parking directional signs to get you into parking. Then we have, from a pedestrian standpoint, we have the uh, kiosk, a map, and uh, oop, why that happen? Give it a second. Okay. So those are the that's the kit of parts from a design standpoint. I think this is what you're talking about, um, Donna. The freestanding um, landmark element um, we're proposing at the intersection of Main and uh, Route 2 Memorial is really the gate, one of the gateways into downtown. Um, 
and this actually is also an opportunity where we have city property that we can utilize to put this um, uh, monolithic element. The, the, the restriction that we have is that we're limited to 65 square feet um, per side uh, of, of this uh, sign. So it's, it, we, we have looked at larger elements before, um, but we are limited by the state statute that um, freestanding uh, signage within downtown be limited to this, which is still quite visible. Um, and it takes on the icon of the capital and is visually tied into the whole system. This is, we're going to go one by one now through all the sign types. This is the next, the vehicle sign type. Um, there's going to be the most of these signs, up to about 30 signs um, throughout downtown. And this will give vehicles clear direction to the various cultural destinations based on the hierarchy that we, that we just showed. And then the back of the sign will have um, these, uh, these, these visual patterns of, of the capital. This is a rendering in Photoshop showing the context of how the sign relates to the architecture and the space. It also includes a, um, an appendage that um, includes the, the bicycle path to get bicycles to the, um, the new extended bike path that's taking place. This is the material, the, the color and material palette for the back of the signs as well as the pedestrian signs. So there's going to be a variation. It's not always the same color. It has, a, a, has kind of a, um, a, a range of, of treatment. So after you get out of your car and you start exploring downtown, there are several of these located um, that will get you to destinations. And they're two-sided. Sometimes they're two-sided with messages. If they're not two-sided with messages, they have the back side of the capital. These are just some details of the cutout lettering above. So a strong sense of craftsmanship in terms of how they are um, built. And a couple of renderings that show them in situ with the information booth on State Street as well as on the corner of State. Uh, parking signs, one of the biggest things that came up in our, our public meetings is no one knows how to park. no one knows where to park there's plenty of parking but where do we park um, and a lot of the lots are behind buildings or tucked away so this directional system will help people get there did you just say there's plenty of parking <laughs> there's been studies about that it's interesting it's a controversial that is not the position here. of popular life <laughs> <laughs> this is the front and back of the kiosk. So uh, this is something that would be maintained over time uh, by, by Montpelier uh, Alive in the city um, to update um, businesses listed here um, in the downtown area only. Um, and what we're looking at here is actually a placeholder for a map. The map would zoom in on the downtown and locate all the destinations and help warrant you. These would be located in three places. Um, in front of the State House, uh, in front of uh, City Hall, and in front of uh, City Center. How does that work when a business changes? Yeah, so um, as it's designed here, uh, it can be updated relatively easily. Um, and the idea would be that it would be updated on a regular basis, perhaps twice a year. Um, we are looking at whether that even that makes sense because there is the cost and effort of updating it. So we may just include institutions and sort of districts rather than listing individual businesses. If you were to update it, sorry, if you were going to update it, how do you do that physically? Like, what is that process? Well, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, 
the the map would have uh, numbered labels potentially, and then those labels would be correspond to the the listing below, as you see in the gray portion of the sign. That portion could come out and get updated. Oh, so okay. it's not it's the whole bit. panel; it's just the directory. Okay. Um, and if that becomes too cumbersome, um, then you know, uh, Dan and I are going to work on this um, and develop, you know, how this, how this is maintained over time. Um, but there are options where we can actually zone out certain areas where uh, businesses are clumped clump together in different areas and those areas get updated over time. So there's different strategies that, that can work here. Um, it's, it has a lot to do with feasibility and, and cost. Um, <clears throat> but I will point out that the, the reason why we came up with this um, is because through the, the interviews and the public sessions that we had two years ago, um, it, it was very important for the small businesses to be represented in this system somehow. They can't be represented on the vehicle signs. Um, that's, that's not allowed. Um, but to have some kind of either web um, presence or on street presence in the form of this kiosk is um, is the solution that we're looking at well, while we're talking about this um, would it be possible to uh, do like QR codes or something that people could then use to uh, bring up a business directory on their phones you know QR codes um, they were a great idea maybe five years ago, but they're, they, no one's really using them anymore, um, is what we've found. Um, instead, they're using local apps, a lot of Google, Yelp, all these things that are really tied in and actually um, won't necessarily replace what we're doing, but will add to it. Um, you're always going to have the visitor um, that you know, plans their trip, does everything online beforehand and then has Google directions to everything, right? You're also going to have the people, the explorers who come and just want to experience, be more spontaneous. And that's where this system will help, help them. Um, but everyone have, has phones now and there's lots of different apps that can help you respond to the environment very quickly with what's available in the area. Um, QR codes have become kind of uh, cumbersome you know you have to have the software to scan it and then it sends you to a website it's um, it was it was good when we wanted sort of direct it's mostly for advertising is really what it's been successful for um, and less about um, wayfinding and 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 locale but there's certainly the possibility that if individual businesses are not listed in the directory that we refer people in some way to the Montpelier Life website. To the, website, to the to website, yeah. 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 OK, so the, the next half of this presentation is fairly detailed. Um, and I'm not sure if how much detail you want to go into. Um, but it. I want to consider the time. Yeah, so exactly. So it's so what we have here are locations for all the signs and then cross-referenced with all of the messages um, with the signs, including the pedestrian signage as well. Um, and as Dan said, these, these messages are, are going to be um, refined and, and, and finalized over the next year. So I had a couple of comments kind of about those last um, bunch of, of slides, um, one of which was there's a lot of references to the East Business District, and I have no idea what that is, um, and I don't think a lot of people do, and I don't think businesses refer to themselves as being located there. I assume it means River Street. Yeah, so um, the, the state prefers that signs refer to, uh, it don't refer to things by their street name unless they're known by that in like master plan and official documents, which 
the, uh, we're, the East Business District, uh, Corey, you said that you actually didn't see it in the master plan, but uh, um, anyway, we're going to review that and okay. look at whether it is possible to save River Street. I would, I would love I for it to have some kind of tie into the location so yeah. people know where yeah, it sure. is. Yeah. We can make it official by including River Street business or River Street district? Is that what we would Yeah, it would do? need to say district. Okay. Yes, we can't just say River Street. Right. I was a little surprised to see the Berry Street Berry District. Yes. Uh, I mean, I was like, oh, right, right. Oh, district. right. So, Corey, that's the issue. The master plan <laughs> refers to the Berry Street businesses as being in the Berlin Street District, oh. which, um, huh. so, <laughs> yes. So that's the problem. The Berry Street District is in the master plan, but then it's the Berlin Street District in the master plan. Um, so we, we will review how to do that, and if it requires the and council. It is Berlin Street until it goes up the hill. Right. So. Well, we don't need this done. If we, between right. now and spring, we can get it in, yeah. in the master plan. Yes. River Street. There you go. If we, yes, if we learn that we can't just call it the River Street District, we will find some way for you to name it the River Street District so that we can call it that. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. I, I don't know if you all are done. If you were done, I'm done. I well, think we are. Happy to okay, take questions, great. sure. So I've got more. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm relieved to hear that this is sort of, I, I'm good with the overall plan. I think this, this is much needed, and I don't have any problems with the overall plan. I just had more kind of um, more minor comments that I had um, sent along. Um, one of them was about uh, the bike path and wanting to include that, um, hopefully by next when these are being located, we may actually have some portions of the bike path. Yeah. Right. Um, and so we'd, of course, want to point people to it and also have signs on the bike path pointing people to where to get off for businesses and mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. Um, so I'd want to make sure that we included that. Um, and then I was really confused by the logos for the shopping, dining, and parking. They were Sometimes they were next to the business district. Sometimes they mm -hmm. were below them, and they were sort of inconsistent mm -hmm. with how they were applied. So that would be a, an area for... Yeah, and that is one, there was one particular There's time more that refinement changed that already in the okay. PowerPoint that yeah. we couldn't get to load. But. Um, and then um, one other comment that I, I didn't send along before is I would love to have restrooms somewhere on the pedestrian signs um, and also on the map, um, public restrooms. Sure. We've got City Hall, we'll have uh, yep. the new one Taylor, um, and wherever else we've got public restrooms, the visitor center. Um, that would just be, I think, a great addition. That makes a lot of sense. Uh huh. And we'll play about that recently. <laughs> um, one of the things that I don't see on here, I don't see the train station listed. I know it's a ways out, but it would be helpful for people to know that that actually does exist. Um, I wish it were closer to town. It's unfortunate that it's not. Um, and also uh, the bus. Portion. I, I'm not sure if all of the bus routes are going to transition into town, but um, making sure that people know that those things do actually exist in Montpelier is super helpful too. Um, and I, I just didn't see those on here and want to make sure. Yeah, we had conversations about that. Um, and at the time, the committee felt it was important to see how the transportation center would replace all of that um, to some degree. So. Um, <coughs> This is an it's a scalable system, so we can we can uh, we can address that as as it comes through. Yeah, I just I think if if our goal is to sort of increase reliance, we yeah. just got to let everybody know that these things do exist, although not at the most convenient place right now, and right, we're working right. on it. <laughs> yeah, good uh, Glenn. Um, I think it's a great plan in general, and I'm also interested in. Uh, while we add signs, this isn't necessarily your department, but potentially uh, subtracting signs where they're duplicated. So for example, on the Photoshop. Uh, There's a bike sign, right. uh, bike pass sign. That's which, an old um, photograph. Yeah, that sign is actually not there anymore. OK, good. Um, but yes, that would <laughs> <laughs> certainly be part. Uh, <laughs> that would certainly be uh, part of it, is once okay. the wayfinding's in place. Um, I know, for instance, that it would the parking signs would replace the existing parking signs. Um, there would be other signs, I'm sure, as well, that we'd find. Uh, so, oh, Donna, go ahead. You, you have City Hall with food and shopping? You know that? 
Yes. Uh, so that's going back to that okay. comment before, okay. we're going to reorganize some of that. I believe that's the one we fixed right now. But you didn't the know there's any new food, food court here. <laughs> icons are under City yeah. Hall. You know, when the <laughs> obvious gets missed, that's good. But also, within your map, I would assume you'd have a symbol for bus stops. Not sure. Your yeah. transportation center signs are there, but the map itself needs to have. Mm -hmm. bus yeah, the, the map has not been designed yet. Okay. So okay. Um, all that information is going to be, yeah. Uh, as a separate thing, I mean, I assume you all have not gone to the design review committee. Not that you need to, necessarily, but it, I'd like to make a recommendation that you do, just out of courtesy. Um, you know, anything, uh, any other business that was putting up a sign in the, that area would go to the design review committee. I, I think it's probably a good idea, and um, they've got a lot of expertise in that in this area. So I think it'd be good to, I would encourage you to go. Uh, I don't think it would cost you anything, because it's a city um, endeavor. So. Um, yeah, I just want to put that out there. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, Connor, and then I'd love to open up um, comments from the public. Yeah, no more comment. I think it's a great plan, fellas. Um, I do think as we look at adding signs downtown, it might be a worthy endeavor to bring our uh, legislative delegation in uh, to look for increased signage out on the uh, highway there to mark Montpelier's historic downtown. Uh, we can do all this stuff, but it's no good if people don't turn off the highway and come downtown. Um, so I think that's something we could look at in the transportation or capital bills. So I'd be happy to help on that one. All right. Uh, comments from the public? Yeah. Hi, I'm Eric Gilbertson again. I just got reappointed to the Historic Preservation <laughs> Commission. And following off on your comment, I think you need to do something with the historic district and historic buildings downtown. Either part of the mapping or anything, it's a very significant part mm -hmm. of what makes Montpelier what it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know how to incorporate it into your plan, but you could do it in, in the mapping for mm -hmm. sure. Absolutely. And there's some space on the back of the signs maybe that you could have a little history piece about the downtown and about Montpelier. Sure. So I think people really like to read that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's definitely something we can look into. Yep. That would be great. Yep. Thank you. Cool. Other comments? Uh, Jack. It's more of a question than a comment, but uh, for many years, for most of his career, my father-in-law was a municipal traffic engineer, so I know that there are all these federal regulations and all kinds of regulations. I assume that all these signs comport with the yes, with any we, federal regulations. We received oh, yeah. approval from the state that we were following. The state guidelines are what would govern that. Um, and we received approval from the state at a meeting this morning. Just questions. Um, what are the next steps? But what happens yeah. between now and when we see them on the street? Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, we are going to um, put out bids, uh, put out the project for bids hopefully next month, um, which will give us some idea of exactly how much money we're talking about. Um, we have uh, some initial estimates that were much higher than we were hoping. Um, so uh, we have made some changes since then and um, also um, in the bidding process hoping to do some cost containment um, and then that will once we have the bids that will allow us to move forward um, in applying for that downtown transportation fund grant uh, the applications due I believe in March or, or April um, and there's a pretty quick turnaround on that um, and right. and then um, can I ask you about that are you hoping to entirely fund it through that grant or no okay. it requires um, a maximum of a hundred thousand with a hundred thousand grant uh, match, match. Um, and so we would be applying for the maximum amount. Um, and we believe that we have Good to uh, ahead of time. Have on hand or will, by the time we apply, have on hand the 100000 for the match. Um, oh, OK. Great. Yes. yes. Um, and then uh, assuming that we get approval of that grant, uh, the fabrication would commence quickly right. after that. Um, so between now, now and then, obviously, we'd be working to finish the messaging. and and all of those pieces right. uh, with the goal of having um, all of the signage in place by the end of right. next calendar year. Which is the reason why the kiosk isn't fully designed, the mapping isn't done, the historical and the bus routes aren't 
you're not seeing that at the moment is because we need to get commitment from our budget whether we can you know how many of these we're going to build and then we will design that so we, we we're doing this in phases and trying to be very um, cognizant of the money that we do have and how we spend it great uh, Rosie then Donna sorry go for it, Rosie, yeah. well, I thought initially your first price was over 300,000 so if you have a hundred thousand and your grants a hundred thousand where's the third hundred thousand coming from? yeah so we've made some changes to the plan that should reduce the cost um, for one uh, we were initially going to have more of the welcome monuments but actually the location that we uh, wanted was not approved by the state plan so we're down to one monument um, there have been some changes that were actually required to comply with the guidelines from the state in terms of how big letters could be, had to be and things like that um, that made us remove, um, there was some aluminum Montpelier cutouts at the top of the um, uh, we've uh, traffic we've side. So we've changed some of the things. 200,000 will, will do it? Uh, well, we don't know that for sure. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think it's too premature to say. It is. Yeah. It, it really is. Really is. The, this is a, um, it, you know, as, as Dan said, you know, once it, this goes into um, a bid, um, we have the opportunity to kind of compare costs between the bidders as well as consider alternatives to get the cost down per sign type. So it is a process. Rosie. Um, this may be sort of late to the game, but um, th in terms of thinking about the fabrication and reducing future costs, um, if there's anything in the fabrication that can allow our DPW sign shop to do minor updates in the future if, if updates are needed mm -hmm. um, or additions need to be made mm -hmm. to an existing sign, that kind of thing, I think that would be really that would be a plus when considering bids in mm -hmm. my mind. Mm -hmm. cool. All right, so I think we need a motion um, about approving this plan. I would move that we approve the complete streets. Way sorry, finding. wayfinding. Master plan. It's like it, it's all part of complete <laughs> streets to me. Uh, I would move that we uh, approve the wayfinding plan as presented this evening. Any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. great. Thank you so hey, much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Looking forward to this. It's going to be great. Okay. On to the water resource recovery facility updates. Okay. Sure. Sure. Uh, uh, hey team, water resource recovery. We actually might pause on you for a minute. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> one, one, yeah, what one. Is the penalty? So, um, are there folks here for the UES reading? Um, ordinance the ordinance. Union Elementary School. Union Elementary School. Nope. No. Okay. Then. Okay. Just kidding. You. Yeah, but it's it's back back to you. There's a little bit of ping pong there, but you know. There we go. Back to you. Five-yard penalty, Mayor. I know, right? <laughs> All our penalties okay, are in Thank time. you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes off the clock. <laughs> so we do have a PowerPoint. Um, uh, uh, that set up. Oh, you have a presentation. We do, yep. <laughs> we now know the weakness of killing teal. Bring chocolates. Full 
slideshow, a couple over. Um, yeah. From beginning, yeah. Good. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Kurt Modica, city engineer. I've got Chris Cox, our chief wastewater plant operator here, and Todd Preventure, uh, finance director. So um, we've talked about this project a few times. Um, here to sort of hopefully answer any outstanding questions and, um, and make a recommendation when we get to the end of this presentation. So starting off with the questions from our last meeting, um, there were three things that we were asked to look into. One was the capacity of the existing generator at the facility to power both the existing and the proposed equipment under the project. Um, the engineers from ESG have gone through that and uh, they have confirmed that the, the generator will be able to run all the equipment. It would be running at 96% of its capacity, um, but it will be able to run the facility. Uh, the second item we were asked to look into um, was to go and visit another site uh, that ESG has um, worked on through a similar type of project, uh, energy performance contract. <clears throat> so Chris and I went out to um, the Frederick Winchester Authority um, project, which is a much bigger facility. It was uh, roughly a $46 million project with ESG. And uh, they process about 12 million gallons a day of waste as compared to four or so that we have designed for. And uh, just some of the highlights from that trip, um, we talked to the operators at the facility and they did make note that ESG worked through all the construction issues. Um, there's always going to be construction issues on any project, especially one of that size. Um, and one of the, the other real interesting parts of the visit that we learned is that ESG has a lot of pull with the equipment manufacturers and they were actually able to work with them to sort of make some design modifications to the equipment, which the vendors then implemented into their um, manufacturing process so that those modifications are really uh, carried through to the next project that they are um, used on. So it was interesting to see, um, you know, sort of that process. Um, it's a little bit unique in that uh, ESG really has purchasing because they purchase so much equipment, they really have a lot of pull and are able to um, get the manufacturer's attention to come and help resolve any construction issues that arise, but also improve their equipment. And um, they were able to exceed their uh, guarantee revenue by over 100% in, in the first year. And I believe within two years, they were able to meet um, their entire guarantee for the project. Um, and the other important part is that they are entering into a phase two contract with ESG. So uh, obviously the facility was happy with, uh, with what they got um, working with ESG and um, continuing to work with them. And the third item that we were asked to look into is the, um, the impacts of the appeal of our discharge permit. So some, some points, we, we did um, submit a technical memo from ESG on this, sort of outlining the details of um, the appeal and what they're really um, what they're really looking at uh, on the appeal. So, Chris and Tom McArdle, the director, and I, we went to the to the hearing, and really what we took away from that was that CLF isn't looking to lower our discharge limits of phosphorus. Really, what they're hoping to achieve is uh, a reduction in non-point source pollution. So that's stormwater and um, land applied. Um, biosolids and part of what this project will do uh, will give the city of Montpelier the ability to take land applied solids and process them at the treatment plant to really drop those phosphorus levels so um, in a big way this this plant actually accomplishes some of the goals that we believe CLF is after through their permit appeal um, the other part of that uh, of the discussion here is that if they were to successfully appeal our permit uh, it could be years before uh, we receive a new permit. So the judge isn't going to issue our permit 
if uh, if the per if the appeal is successful, it'll go back to the state. Um, they'll have to rewrite a permit, and then it'll get uh, resubmitted with an appeal per period. So that process could be years, and it's really a, an unknown at this time what the time frame will be. Um, so those were sort of the <laughs> summary of what we were asked to look into. Is there any questions on that or any more details that you guys are looking for on those questions? Do you happen to know what was the term for the project that you looked at that met their guarantee within two years, just to give that some context? Um, the initial projection. Of the how long the guarantee was going to be for? So I'm not sure. Maybe ESG can answer that question. Ball. Five years? Five, five years. Okay. And ours is? Ours is a 20 year. Okay, so this is the, a summary of what we've been working on since, uh, since we were here in, um, since May or June, the last time we talked to you. Uh, we've received updating pricing, updated pricing from the, uh, the contractors. Uh, ESG has submitted a detailed engineering evaluation, which went to the state of Vermont. Um, who sort of, uh, they don't issue a permit for construction, but they do a, a design review uh, and write, um, they do write an approval letter eventually. We don't have that yet, but we met with the state and they uh, agreed with the assumptions and, uh, in that report. So it looks like there's not going to be any issues as far as state permitting. Um, we've received the contract from ESG, uh, Public Works, and our uh, independent engineering consultant, Aldridge and Elliott, have both reviewed and commented on that. Uh, we did have quite a few comments, um, but it, nothing in, in discussions with ESG that we can't resolve at this point. Uh, we've also had a meeting um, and then sub subsequently uh, ESG has developed the measurement and verification program for the savings um, and tipping fee revenue. So really went through each aspect of, um, of the guarantee, um, decided how we're going to measure it, how we're going to verify it, and got that all into a document that we've uh, reviewed. And um, we've also um, reviewed the guarantee documentation from ESG which we'll get into uh, in another slide, a little more detail. And we've had a preliminary um, meeting uh, discussing public outreach on the, on the project for the bond vote, and MIAC is uh, involved with that. So an update on the pricing of the project and what has changed since June. Um, when we last met, we were estimating a $16.1 million project based on a 5% escalation cost from the last contractor pricing. Currently, uh, we're at 16 point, well, we were at 16.2 million because actual escalation ended up being just over 5%. And then once we uh, really reviewed the scope of work, uh, we identified a few things that needed to be added into the project. Uh, the grit collector is a one of the original pieces of equipment at the plant that really needs to be upgraded. Um, the gas detection, which is uh, for the methane, um, needed to be added in uh, for safety. And then the other two items were for um, treatment redundancy. So we added um, a third polymer blending unit and a third dewatering thickening feed pump. So that if we were to lose one of those two pumps, we would still have the redundancy to keep the facility working. So with those add-ins, we ended up at 16.5 million. And then the owner's reserve is, um, it's, it's essentially a contingency. Um, if the city were to add scope to the work, not identified in the contract, um, or and right now we also have the building permit fee included in that number, which we're estimating right now at about $100,000. Um, and that also will cover any overages in solids disposal for, um, for cleaning the digesters. So we add all that up and we end up with a total bond amount of $16.75 million. Kurt? Yes. The additions, is that because of a deeper look by engineers what needed to replace or is it because sheer time has passed? 
No, that was actually based on um, review by Public Works and A and E of of the scope of the project, okay. and we re we requested that those be added into the scope. Yeah. So between now and when this project, if it went ahead, gets installed, are there <coughs> are there going to be any other pieces that need to be replaced that we're not considering now? Well, we don't anticipate anything major, but that owner's reserve is meant to cover small items that might be added. But we've done a pretty thorough review at this point. That's the same thing as contingency. It is. So if uh, if there are no identified items, um, not all of that two hundred fifty thousand would get used. It would go back the, to the city. These new parts here weren't part of the previous contingency, so that's why I'm asking. Okay. Yeah, we hadn't conducted a real detailed review of the plans and um, and the contract at that point. I don't like to hear that. Well, I mean. Yeah, we were. <laughs> we didn't have all the information we needed to do a full review. We do now. Um, this is why Todd's up here with me. The, um, <laughs> the budget and rate impact comparison. So this is a really uh, probably one of the most difficult things to predict on this project. Um, is what, what's going to happen to the rates because there are a lot of variables. Uh, there's, there's usage fees uh, and there's fixed components, there's commercial users, users, there's residential users. And then there's the question of do you pay for it, a lot of it up front, do you spread it over 10 years, do you spread it over 20 years? So there's a, a many, many different ways that you could look at um, rates. and. This is just one example of a potential uh, rate change. Um, I think really what we need to do is have a, a rate committee meeting and uh, sit down and determine the best way to go about um, you know, funding, funding the upgrade at the plant. So um, just to run through it quickly, um, we're looking what one scenario, like I said, this is only an option, is to have a, uh, an 8% increase in the first year and that's really whether we do the AI project which is just you know what we have to do at the facility for infrastructure improvements or whether we do the AI combined with the organics energy project um, we're really looking at a very similar rate increase on year one um, and even on the projected because uh, because the debt service on a 16 uh, point seven million dollar project. You need an increase uh, up front um, to re to cover the uh, the bond costs of the project, the principal and interest. And then going down to the um, the average annual rate increases in years two through ten, um, you do see a difference in the uh, AIOE projected increase. We're looking at um, you know, a five point five percent versus a seven percent annual increase on projected revenue. So, um, I don't know if you want to speak to this a little yeah, bit, Todd. So, I, there is just a tremendous number of variables that go into developing a rate structure, especially when you're trying to spread the cost of a major project um, over, you know, the span of a decade, essentially, and not hit everybody with it, a tremendous rate increase all on the front side. Um, what we did when we did the analysis to come up with the AI and the OE, um, AI is a given. So we don't really have any option for a zero, do nothing approach. Um, so there's gonna be a significant cost, whether it's $8 million or $16 million uh, in this situation. So it really becomes a question of um, if we go with the AI, there's no potential upside. It's a fixed cost, we know what it is. And then in year 10, we get hit with another five plus million dollar escalated cost for, for additional improvements um, versus in the OE model, we're paying more on the front end, but we don't have that significant uh, additional upgrade at year 10. Um, and when I was doing my analysis to come up between the AI and OE at the guarantee column, uh, I tried to look at it stripping out every possible rosy projection, and no offense, <laughs> Councillor Kruger, Kruger. Um, I, I tried to strip anything out that wasn't, like, specifically guaranteed 
in writing, <laughs> so so that any so just to paint a, a worst case scenario, we're most likely going to do much better than that. And based on the track record of ESG and similar facilities in other parts of the country, I feel good about that. But I can't, in good faith, come before you and say everything is wonderful because I had to predict. What's the worst? I'd rather come back to you and say, hey, we don't have to raise rates <laughs> as much as we were originally thinking. Um, the benefit is that we also uh, set rates annually. Um, so we have the opportunity to look at this uh, as it develops and each year analyze the revenue sources coming in and make adjustments kind of on the fly, if you will. Um, but I want to be realistic about the fact that it does, it's going to cost money to do either project and it's not necessarily fair to look at um, the primary rate comparison that we did was over 10 years, but that's not really picking up the entire life of the project. So there, there's a couple of different scenarios that we can do. When I look at purely the project, cash flow versus cash flow, AI versus OE, OE is the way to go. Um, and you included the revenue and it still comes out the same? I included the revenue in Everything but the first column has revenue there, but none of the rates reflect it. I'm sorry, Don, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> well, in this chart, uh -huh. it says the average annual budget impact yep. increases. Right. So one year is at 92000 another year is 285000 Now, is that not, that's not cash, that's just benefit? <laughs> so the, the $580,000 increase under um, AI in the AI OE at guaranteed level is offset by additional savings and revenues to get to the net of the $92,000 so benefit on the project. Where it becomes a little bit more complicated, <laughs> and I don't necessarily want to dive too deep into the weeds, is that from the financial statement perspective, we still have to account for the depreciation expense um, of the project. So while on the cash and project side specifically, we can look at cash flow differences. We are still going to be investing in a $16 million plant versus upgrade versus a $9 million upgrade, and that has to be amortized in, um, as a depreciation expense over the life of the project uh, or the life of the underlying useful asset. So um, there's a couple pieces at play here, um, and the guaranteed revenues are significantly lower than what the projections are actually expected to be. And then there's a compounding effect within the rate structure that occurs so that the more, you know, the more we raise rates in year one, that's going to have a greater impact on the rates in years two, three, and four, even if we lower that percentage increase. So if we were to go up by 8% in year one, that then is the compounded effect that a 3% or 5% rate is going to be impacted by the following year. Um, so depending on how we structure that, that rate um, kind of dictates where we end up. I, I don't know if I answered your question or confused you. <laughs> so I have a few questions. Um, so Todd, I'll just start with my first question for you. So I'm a lawyer, not anything good at math, but uh, $16.75 million for this project and $10 million makes it, well, for the parking garage, makes $26.75 million is the, could be the maximum request for bond. Um, so I know that we have, as a council in the past, agreed to have a, um, a sort of bond debt to grand list ratio. And I'm curious um, if you could give us the breakdown for where only bonding for this project, which I will totally expose my hand, is the project that I favor bonding for uh, as opposed to the parking garage. And I have other questions about um, the sort of uh, logistics of the plant upgrades, which I will ask both of you. Um, so could you kind of give us the breakdown where just bonding this project, just bonding the parking garage, and bonding the two would leave us in terms of that bond to grand list ratio? To some extent, yes. Um, okay. OE, this project bond, bonding at $16.75 million, um, in addition to the current debt that we have outstanding, keeps us within the City Council's self-imposed policy of not exceeding 15% of total budgeted revenue. And that is assuming 
a 0.5% increase, so half a percent increase in revenue annually. annually. When I add the, a $10 million forecasted <coughs> uh, bond for a parking garage and amortize it on a level basis over the next 20 years, just level payments, um, we tick up to just under 18%, but that does not account for any additional revenue that would be coming in from either the education fund under the TIF or any revenue from parking. Um, so I really think that we're within the scope uh, or you know, very close um, given those factors. Um, all right, so for you guys. Um, so how much new development could Montpelier sustain assuming, well, I'm going to ask this in a two-part way. So assuming that we only did the aging infrastructure project, how much new development could Montpelier sustain and have things continue to function at least at the most basic level, which I'm not saying is acceptable, but? Um, yep, so we have looked at this, and I think... Um, trying to remember the exact percentage but we had proposed um, to the state uh, an assumption on population growth in Montpelier so if you look historically at the census data the population in Montpelier has been stagnant or actually decreased a bit um, I think it maybe ESG uh, Bob you can help me with this I think is it one or two percent we proposed a one percent annual compounding growth uh, over 20 years so, and that would be for the aging infrastructure upgrades only? We didn't uh, break it out per either. Uh, okay. Hi, uh, Bob Wimmer with ESG. Um, when we were doing the review with the state, uh, we proposed a 1% annual compounding growth in order to evaluate whether or not the facility had all the capacity to continue treatment. Um, because we were only proposing on the total project to the state for review, we did not break out the two components of the project. Okay, so it's fair to say, though, that without the uh, OE project that Montpelier, I don't want to put words into anyone's mouth, and I realize I might be doing that. So please, if I'm wrong, correct me. It, so if we don't do this project, Montpelier cannot sustain the development that we as a council had sort of anticipated based on the zoning changes and the sort of other things in the works. Mm. No, I mean, under the AI project, the capacity of the plant to treat, it is, um, it's still there. On the, under either scenario, we have capacity to take residential. So the, the limits at the plant are based on... Um, it's called BOD, which is really like a, the concentration of the wastewater coming in. And residential has a very low relative concentration as opposed to dairy and um, other types of waste that we're looking to take in under the OE project. So I think under either scenario, there's room for growth for, for residential and, and a lot. Is that fair? Yes. So that's my next question is commercial. So the proposal, the sort of other proposal that residents are going to be asked at the bond vote relates to the construction of another hotel um, and the parking garage, which will create runoff. And I realize that that's sort of treated a different way. But um, so does the existing facility, assuming no additional upgrades, let's just assume that, um, of any kind, whether it's the OE or the AI project, um, what impact would that sort of commercial development have? Well, on? hotel is a similar um, strength of waste as residential because it's okay. the same type of thing coming up. The problem if we don't do anything is that our, our existing equipment is at the end of its useful life. So we may end up in permit violations as, a, as equipment were to fail. Um, not actually being able to treat any waste is as equipment comes offline. So we can't, we don't think it's a, a reasonable option to do nothing at the plant, to not do any upgrade, just because um, these things are 40, 50 years old and just starting to really not work as well as they as they are should. Um, but, but as far as supporting that type of, of, of development, I think on, in either case we could support it, assuming, assuming we do these upgrades and our equipment is kept functional. Um, the type of high strength waste that um, that would be difficult for us to accept through the liquid stream, like through the pipes, 
um, is breweries. Um, Which we also have coming. But that will be, so, yes. And um, we if they truck their waste so that it goes through, there's sort of two paths at the plant. One is for solids or high-strength waste, and one is for the liquids coming through the pipe. If it goes through the, the solid stream, which is being upgraded into the OE project, we, had, we do have the capacity to take brewery waste. But it has to be trucked instead of piped. So with the OE, we, have the, we, we gain the ability to be able to support brewery waste or that, type, that sort of um, discharge. That's the similar I issue, actually, that Burlington is dealing with, with all their brewery waste. Talk to them about trucking it here instead of them having to spend millions of dollars. Okay. Yeah. We can't hear you. I can't hear you. I just said that's the similar issue that Burlington has with their brewery west. At least there was a big article in seven days a couple weeks ago about all the successful breweries in Burlington, and now it's creating impacts at their plant. So it's the same idea. They're working together on this. So. Just follow up on one of Ashley's questions. Um, so, what happens to the guarantee if we happen to have a ton of residential growth that means that we then have less capacity for the high strength waste? Um, yeah, maybe she yes, can speak to that. But I can. So, the we needed to uh, present to DC a projection for growth. Um, because historically there has not been. So we elected the 1% just as a, a very conservative growth factor. There is more than enough capacity at the facility to go above that, um, but we wanted to, to present something that was reasonable and provided a conservative. Relative to the guarantee, um, your ability to grow does not impact our responsibility as part of the guarantee. Um, we feel very comfortable that uh, the facilities have the capacity to make to do all the treatment that's necessary. And again, because these are two different uh, streams coming into the plant, uh, the development is what comes in through the general sewers, uh, through the pipes coming in, and the other waste is trucked in. Um, we've That waste is segregated, and we believe that uh, we can treat that waste even with the plant at full capacity. So our guarantee is going to hold even if suddenly, uh, you know, sudden a uh, huge population increase comes here. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions on budget and rate impacts? Okay. Budget slides up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is a uh, just a graphical comparison of the three different scenarios, the orange being the aging infrastructure project, um, the blue line is the guaranteed projections, and the light gray is um, projected or estimated actual revenue and uh, or budget impact comparison. Um, the spikes are for maintenance items. Uh, we have to clean our digesters. It's a fairly high cost every five years. Um, but really this is just meant to illustrate that there is a, a, a lower impact based on the, um, the projected revenue and savings option. Over time. Yep, especially as you're getting the out here, it really spreads out. Um, so this, is, this graph looks at the three components of the guarantee. Um, there's operational energy savings and revenue and and really what it shows is that the upside to the project um, uh, is really on the revenue the tipping fees that there's a lot of potential to uh, exceed um, to exceed the guarantee level and so that's sort of what Todd was talking about is that there is a big upside to the OE project financially for the city um, as uh, you know, as compared to the red, is uh, is really um, demonstrating what the AI project levels would be. Sure, it the upside is all, all to the city. Right? That's right. There's yep. Not any split with ESG. That's right. Anything above the guarantee level is 100% um, goes to the city's fund. How do they stay in business? <laughs> 
<laughs> so a uh, little more detail on how the guarantee works. Um, the the total um, with that that last graphical we showed, adding up the different components um, of energy savings and tipping fee revenue comes to five hundred sixteen thousand dollars of annual. Um, that averages out to 92,000 above the AI project only. 100% uh, of the energy savings is guaranteed for the term of the contract. Um, the operational savings are made up of sludge disposal, uh, chemical use, and water savings. Whoops. And the tipping fee revenue of two hundred fifty-five thousand um, is guaranteed for the for the term of the contract. And as Jeff uh, noted, the city retains all of the upside revenue above and beyond the guarantee. Um, there is a uh, cap on shortfalls of five percent of the contract price for the uh, first five years of the project. It comes out to eight hundred twenty-five thousand, and then that cap reduces in the out years. Um, and one thing that we've talked about uh, with previous council is a third party surety. Right now, uh, we don't have a third party bond built into the finance, uh, the, the cash flow. It's relatively low cost uh, if, this, if the council were to elect to have a third party surety bond. Um, I think you know, we, we uh, looked at some uh, rough numbers and it's uh, probably under $3,000 annual uh, cost to have an outside bonding company um, back up um, the guarantee by ESG. So what that would do essentially is protect the city if ESG were to go bankrupt. And, and really, that's pretty much the only scenario that, um, that we would use that third party bond. Um, and we have asked, or I've asked our uh, our attorneys reviewing the contract to um, make a recommendation on whether or not that's something the city should pursue. Options for phase two. Um, you know, the drivers for doing a phase two project is uh, you know moving towards net zero goals of the city, um, and then the potential for additional savings and revenue. And really, we've narrowed it down to three options that are um, are the most beneficial. The one new development since last time we talked is um, the opportunity to wholesale the methane. If we were to um, clean it and compress it, it could be sold as natural gas. And um, the company DCP Midstream, which actually has a facility uh, right across the road from the plant, has uh, expressed interest in purchasing natural gas uh, from our plant. Um, so there, we're going to be meeting with their um, regional sales manager uh, hopefully in the next few weeks. So it's a really great potential opportunity which, uh, which we expect would have a, a high upside to revenue. The other two options we're looking at is um, <coughs> sludge drying and um, uh, power generation. So. Those will obviously be in a, a separate project. We're not going to be constructing those under this. We, really, we wanted some time to um, to really see what the gas production levels are going to be so that we can right size equipment for the selected alternative. Next steps, um, like I mentioned, we do have a legal review underway of all the contract documents, including the guarantee um, uh, and the measurement and verification uh, document. We do still have to get our final permits, which include the Act 250 amendment, a floodplain permit, and building permit. And then <coughs> they talked about the uh, the wastewater uh, management authorization. Um, as far as the, the schedule, October 3rd is when uh, the bond warding would need to take place. Um, October 24th would be the public hearing, the second public hearing, and then bond vote on November 6th. Just one minor correction to that. The, okay. the second public hearing actually has to be between October 27 and November 5. So we've already talked about the need to create a special meeting okay. for that. We haven't set the date yet. That would be for potentially both bonds and any charter changes. 
Sorry. That would normally be the last council meeting of the month. Okay. And then the last step would be approval of the actual contract with ESG, which would take place after the bond vote. You get the permits during this period or after the bond vote? Um, well, I mean, let, let ESG answer that question as well so as far as the schedule. The permits the, in the time flow, are they being done now or after the bond vote? We can start the permitting uh, next month if you'd like. It's up to you. I assume you would like us to start the permitting. I'm not yeah, I mean, the permitting has already been started, so we've, we've had discussions with Act 250. We've met with the state on that permit. Um, the building permit is relatively short. Um, fairly simple. It's an in-house, you know, city permit. So we really have started them all. I th um, you know, how far we go before the actual bond vote approval, I think um, probably not a whole lot further. I think maybe a little more work on the floodplain permit. Um, but other than that, um, I think we're in pretty good shape to meet timelines where we're at now. So the recommendation, um, so if you, if you really look at the project as a whole, if you uh, consider the rate impacts are going to be the same whether we do an aging infrastructure project or an organic energy project, um, that the unknowns and delaying, so if we, if we decide not to go forward with an organic energy project, uh, we've sort of got to start over. We've got to get a, a design engineer back on board, um, you know, do final design. It's going to be probably a couple of years before we are ready to go out to bid. And there's risk of escalating costs, which we've seen is, uh, is happening now, um, and potentially equipment failure. Um, getting into the market of high-strength waste early puts us in a good position to um, make build relationships with, uh, with clients um, and really get, it, you know, get our foot in the door on, on this sort of business. And, and the project, particularly phase two, but also you know, this project, by using methane for additional heating at the plant, reducing our oil use, it does move us towards um, you know, closer to a net zero community. So we're recommending uh, approval of the bond warning on October 3rd for the um, Organics Energy Project for the $16.7 million upgrade. Um, and but that would be will be contingent on successful final contract negotiations with ESG, including comments from our legal review. Oh, questions. Great, thank you. Uh, so first, any. I know we've been sort of asking questions as we've gone, but any further questions from the council at this point? And then I'd like to open it for the public. Yeah. Um, first, a question that just came up. Thanks, guys. That was great. Uh, so one question about if we go ahead with organics and energy um, between now and potentially moving on to phase two, we're collecting a bunch of methane. What do we do with that methane in the meantime? Are we just storing it, or? So, um, we do, be, yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, sorry, okay. um, we will be storing it. Some of it we'll be using for heating additional buildings, yep. and then the rest will have to be flared. Um, and also, uh, I've had a couple of, I fielded some concerns uh, from residents who see potential danger in collecting more methane and storing it um, in terms of what happens if something explodes. Uh, so I'd like to just check in on that. And also, uh, with this fairly involved and, and large uh, improvement to the plant, uh, I've had some concerns voiced about whether this will require additional city staff uh, or, or staff hours. Um, is that going to happen or not? Right. So uh, first on the, on the methane risk, um, 
the project, uh, all the improvements need well are required to be in compliance with the National Fire Protection Association standards. So um, really, the plant is going to be uh, have improved safety. Um, some of the uh, some of the examples of that are um, explosion proof electrical equipment in hazardous areas, um, new gas monitoring equipment, but probably the most significant improvement is moving the flare away from the digesters, um, which is where the methane is stored. But currently that flare is right basically on the digesters. So that's a big component of the OE project is relocating that. So there'll be a, a quite a bit of safety improvements. Um, so I think the risk is actually going to be reduced. Well, I know it will be reduced from this project. Um, and as far as staffing, there's a lot of automation uh, incorporated into this work. So um, there's two, two sort of labor intensive things right now that take a lot of staff time. Uh, one is um, dewatering the solids. So that's not uh, it's it's not automated because um, there's no level control as we're um, putting the solids into a box. Um, so we have to have staff present anytime we're pressing solids, whereas with the upgrade, um, we'll have level monitoring equipment on that. It could be done partially off hours. Um, and right now we spend a lot of overtime on weekends pressing solids out to keep up with the septage that we're taking in. So um, there's actually potential to reduce overtime hours on the weekends. Um, the second item that takes a lot of staff time is um, when the when the waste comes into the first set of tanks, the primary settling tanks at the plant, um, we have to have staff manually turn pumps on, switch valves to uh, pump that waste to the digesters. That again will be set um, on a timer system so that it can be done off hours on a regular basis without staff having to necessarily be there. Again, something we have to do every weekend, which requires overtime hours. So I think there will be some additional demands as far as um, you know managing high strength waste and uh, coordinating with haulers, not tons, but I think that will be offset by, these, by the automation that we're gonna have from the project. So I don't, do not anticipate additional staff needs at the plant. Recently upgraded. Um, I just want to point out um, there's one graph in here that I think is so important um, for people to understand. Um, and I know you've cl closed your laptop. Um, I don't want to necessarily make you open it again. But there was there was one graph that had bar graphs of the break-even savings, the guaranteed savings, and the projected savings, and that to me spoke really strongly to the fact that we are guaranteed to do better than breaking even on this project um, and that the projections are even better than the guarantees. Um, and with that difference, I mean, and all of that's going to this, the, the difference between that would go to the city and that, um, that, that makes this, uh, it feels like a, an easy choice for, for me on this. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think it is just prudent uh, for us to have a surety bond. Um, and so, you know, if it, uh, if this passes um, in November, which I hope it would, um, uh, I guess I would want to recommend, uh, so you, we had, so Kurt and I emailed a little bit today or yesterday um, about the surety bond and what that would mean. Um, and I don't remember if you discussed uh, like how much that would cost roughly, but it wasn't that much. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we could maybe refine some of those numbers and then, um, I mean, uh, so we had talked about that it was in the ballpark of $5,000 a year, which is really pretty, pretty reasonable. Um, and so that's even something that I would, um, suggest be considered as, uh, just a part of our, you know, the, the annual budget as a, um, uh, just as a safety net. Sure. But yeah. With that, um, bond, we would have to carry it until ESG met the guarantee, and then we'd drop it at that point. So the sooner they met the guarantee, the That's correct. Yeah. We no longer have it. Right. And it would be guaranteed annually, a non-existent so guarantee. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, an annual, it's an annual renewal. So if we decided that everything was meeting all of our expectations in year three, and that we couldn't foresee any reason why we'd want to continue to pay the premium, we could opt out at that point. 
Uh, Ashley. So I, I guess, Bill, my question is for you. Is the request then that we move to approve the bond warning and then set this out with everything else? Or what, so procedurally, what, what would I need to move if I were to make a motion? <laughs> Before you How do, <laughs> I mean, well, we can talk about that, but I also want to give public the public comments. an opportunity to comment as well. Um, so let, can we do that first? That's fine. Okay, comments from the public. Go for it. Uh, I just want to say one thing, that speaking for and, the Energy Committee. And who are, and who uh, are you? Jeff Fitzgerald, and uh, last couple of months we have not had a lot of involvement with ESG and, and DPW, they've really been working together on the technical and numbers involved in this project. And we've kind of sat back and haven't done much. But you shouldn't take that as anything other than our unequivocal support for this project. Um, and I think, you know, talking to Todd and talking to Kurt, I, I think you need to really recognize what, what Todd told you, and that is that he was really using the most conservative numbers he could when he was pulling out and saying there's not going to be a rate impact um, if you go OE as opposed to just the AI. And, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot over the last couple of years, and just sitting here tonight I was thinking, how do you really just kind of anecdotally think about this? So we need a new car. and. You need a new generic sedan, right? And we need it. So somebody is coming to us and saying, look, buy the Tesla, and I will guarantee you that the costs are going to remain the same for the sedan because of the savings I'm going to achieve or you're going to achieve through the Tesla. And they're not only giving you that guarantee, they're also projecting that their savings are going to be way in excess of that. And in the end, you don't have a generic sedan, you have a Tesla. <laughs> it, I mean, really, yeah. I, I am. My whole sort of thing Tesla. Is <laughs> <laughs> you could just, just a Neon Leaf, all that this would do. Time, we didn't need to do all this. No, <laughs> no. I, I, wanna, I also just want to commend uh, these three guys here and anybody else who's really been working with them because they've put ESG through their paces. They went down and saw this other plant. I have talked to them, and I felt very comforted by their experiences and all the details that they've made these folks go through. And I've also been very comforted by ESG whenever I've met and talked with them. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Teresa Thomas. I'm a resident of Montpelier. Also very much in support of this project, and I also want to echo everything that was just said that um, I think these guys have really put in a ton of effort to try and find the best alternatives. Um, I guess I just have a question, um, and it's for Todd. I have a question related to some of the rate projections that you put related to the debt service. So I wasn't for sure if I'm just like tired and not understanding it, or if it was what I understood. It appeared that you were giving rate projections based on debt service for 10 years. Is the plan to actually have this 16.7 plus plus million paid off in a 10-year debt service, or is it actually going to be for the life cycle of the, what the project should be 20 years or 20 plus yeah, years? Yeah, so the, the debt service as we've modeled it right now is expected to be a 25-year repayment cycle. Okay, um, okay, and good. And modeled the rates for only for the first 10 years because of, beyond that, I, I don't feel comfortable making assumptions for something that far out. Okay. So the upside from year 10 out is marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I don't feel like I can make that leap. Okay. Um, I just at least to, as, as, as part of the financial. I just, I just saw that 10 year projection and I was like, I hope they're not looking for 10 year financing. No. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Thank you. <laughs> One thing I would add as well um, that hasn't come up, but Jeff made me think of it was, in terms of a phase two under an AI option, there is no phase two. Um, we're kind of. Can't hear you, Tom. Sorry. Sorry. In terms of uh, if we went with an AI option or the aging infrastructure only, there's no opportunity to do a option two um, for any sort of energy 
savings, whether it be utilizing the methane ourselves or selling methane or anything else, we would be limiting our, our opportunities. Hi, I'm Kate Stevenson from the Energy Committee, and um, I just wanted to mention, Kurt had a tiny bullet point in the presentation that we had m met to talk about outreach to the public, and so just to let you all know that the Energy Committee is um, ready and ready, poised and ready to start a major campaign between now and November 6th. Once we know that this is really going on the ballot, we do want to do a lot of outreach because it's a confusing thing to explain to people. and. Um, so, we're, you know, we're talking about... Just have Jeff do it. He's going to promise everyone a Tesla. <laughs> Don't worry, we're, he's, he's part of this. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we have been thinking a lot about what, what the messaging is, how to explain this to everyone, and um, I look forward to, to spending the next two months working on that. Thank you. Uh, Jack? I was thinking about out outreach too, and I was thinking back to earlier in the year when uh, some of us got to go on the tour of the of the plant and see all the operations, how it works, and uh, an explanation of it. And eight thousand people in the city aren't going to go on a tour of the sewer plant, but uh, if that tour could be reproduced as a video and put on the city's web page, I think that would be, uh, I think there are pe people who would watch it. I don't know how many. I'm the kind of guy who would, but, uh, but it might be worth thinking about. I think you're probably right. Okay, team. Ashley. I have a motion to make. And I would move that we give preliminary authorization to move the Organics to Energy Project proposal to the October 3rd bond approval uh, Agenda item meeting. Second. Um, just one question. Do we, um, preliminary approval? Do we approve the okay. So just <coughs> preliminary approval. Pre pre preliminary approval. That's that works for you. For you. Okay. And that's okay. With the second. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor? Oh, oh yep. <laughs> um, so I've been skeptical of the project all along, and as a layperson, trying to ask as many questions as I can. Um, and I've, I've asked every question I can think of. Um, and at this point, they've been answered satisfactorily. Um, and so this is the point when we have to put our trust in the staff. And so I am doing that. Um, and I, I'm trusting you. And so that's um, why I'm willing to support this at this point. Um, it makes me very nervous. but. <laughs> spending large amounts of money like this should so yes mm -hmm. it's a big deal yeah and for those that are um, curious why we're doing this preliminary approval is that there is a legal window when the council can actually vote to put something on the ballot we're outside of it so what they're really saying is we're we're going over this project and on October 3rd when we actually when we set those warnings it's our intent that we will put it on the ballot then but they can't do that action tonight. So just in case, just to eliminate confusion, this is, I interpret this as the go ahead. Um, and just before the vote, I want to thank our team. Um, we did get great questions from the council and public. I know I pushed them really hard um, and probably ESG really hard and they were very responsive. I think we have the whole office here, right, from ESG. I've <laughs> never seen so many of them. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think in the end, it, it, we got good answers, and we didn't have them in the spring, so I'm glad we got to where we are now. All right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. I'm so looking forward to this. So we're waiting for all your hard work. Okay. Union Elementary School second reading of the new parking ordinance. Um. I, so I, I did mistakenly um, think that some of the ESG staff were union elementary <laughs> school people. <laughs> so I, um, my bad. Um, we, as you know, we passed first reading for these ordinances at the last meeting. They've been in place. We've signed them with your permission. Uh, we have, it seems to be working as well as could be expected given the start of school and confusion and changes, but no major problems. 
and um, we recommend proceeding with second reading. So I think we have to officially open a right. public hearing, so we're going to do that right now. Um, so any comments from the public on uh, this ordinance? Or change, really. Okay, uh, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing, and I'm getting back to figuring out what we need to do. Do we need to uh, vote to approve approve yes. second reading? So um, actually approving the ordinance. Approving the ordinance. Okay, so I uh, would be great if we had a, if we had a motion. I would. Go ahead. I would move that we um, do the thing. Uh, <laughs> 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 Can we put that in the minutes? <laughs> uh, I would move that we approve uh, the uh, temporary parking ordinance uh, as presented at the second reading. Second. Uh, further comments? No. Oh. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. <laughs> I have to abstain. Okay. Great. Um, thank you. All right, and the proposed charter change language for sustainability. Another suggestion, we've got all the tree folks Oh, here. we should do that first. Let's do that first. So we're going to skip uh, the charter change stuff and go to the Emerald Ash Borer recommendation. So come on up, you guys. At the, while they're coming up, at the last meeting, we had a discussion about issues, uh, with obviously the, the issue with the ash borer itself and ways to approach it now and in the future. and. Uh, I expressed concerns about committing to a long permanent, uh, a new full-time employee. Uh, these folks met, came up with a plan. I met with Jeff. I fully support the plan they came up. I think the only minor thing that may or may not come to fruition is the, the reallocation of DTBW staff, but I think we can make something work. I, I wouldn't advise you to hold up on this without just because of that. So I recommend that you approve the 8,000 from the reserve fund, 12,000 from our general reserves, um, with the plan as outlined by uh, Jeff and the tree board. Right, so we don't have anything in our uh, packets about that. So uh, listen, you should have one list of where the funding was supposed to. We don't have anything. Mm -hmm. No, we don't There's have anything. There's nothing. Nope. There's nothing on There's our. Your words. No, no. Maybe not. You have recommendations, but there's nothing. There. Should I? Less. Should I email it to? Um, if. I could I could read it or I could um, email it. Uh oh. Let's see. Um, have anything that looks like I, this? Nope. 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 I'm sure. Shoot. Nope. Mm. Okay. Our people are on it. Okay. <laughs> um, we could do the charter change while Jamie. We could do the charter change while, while we're Jamie's getting making that. copies. Right. Sure. happened in the past. <laughs> that is not indicative of our approach, though. I just want to point out. Okay. Uh, how do we feel about that, team? Is that okay if we shift gears while we're making copies? Uh, okay, so um, the charter change language for sustainability. So um, just for a little context, we uh, had one of our council goals was to um, work towards banning plastic bags um, in Montpelier. And our charter does not currently allow us to do that, and so. Um, uh, but there were, was talk of there uh, that there may be other things um, that we may be interested in doing, and so this is the uh, charter change language that we got back from our uh, lawyer, and uh, had a good conversation with him about sort of some of the specifics as to where this came from um, just the other day. Uh, but before we get into it, I'd be curious for your general impressions. Um, do you like it? What do you want to change? What's okay? Et cetera. Rosie. I feel like this is way too broad. Um, it gives us a lot of powers that the state agency of natural resources currently holds. And I um, don't think that the state is going to look too kindly on giving us those powers. So I'm in favor of us doing a charter change to allow us to, to do stuff with plastic bags in the future. But mm -hmm. I think we need to really scale back. Do you have any suggestions as to what that would be? Um, particularly negative impacts to wildlife. Um, that's one where obviously there's a lot of state regulation around that. Um, and that's one yeah. I would, I don't think it's necessary. We can yeah. talk about the other stuff. Okay. Uh, noted. Any other 
thoughts or comments? I'm just going to offer a process comment. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, and that is you need to or you should adopt language to file with the city clerk um, tonight. <coughs> that can be amended. You can amend it on August, October 3rd when you choose what goes on the ballot. But in order to, you are required to file language within certain time frames, and tonight is the night. So whatever version of this you come up with, you should pass that and file it, knowing that you still can change it <coughs> before it goes on the ballot. Sure. Uh, Rosie, do you have so yeah, I'm looking at it again, and I might suggest that we even like after it says promotes or results in unreasonable litter or waste, in kind of strike system. everything after that because what we're talking about is litter yeah. here. There, there may be some parts um, after that, that I'm interested in, um, but it does go beyond, so we can have that conversation. But yeah, um, other comments, uh, I Donna. I like that first sentence. Uh, I don't think we're talking about the first sentence. Mm -hmm. Could Rosie repeat what she was proposing the there? So if you, I'm sorry, but let's just be clear about what, which part we're talking about. Rosie, you're to B, where we've inserted a bunch of additional powers. Um, so we have the power to regulate or prohibit any condition, activity, enterprise, public nuisance, or matter concerning public health, safety, and welfare. And then the addition is within the city, including any condition, activity, enterprise, public nuisance, or matter that promotes or results in unreasonable litter or waste. I'm okay with keeping that. Um, but then the, um, the degradation of natural environment, negative impacts to wildlife, or increased costs, whether tangible or intangible, to city taxpayers and residents to clean up, manage, or recycle as a result of such condition, activity, enterprise, uh, public nuisance, or matter. Um, I think we could get rid of negative impacts to wildlife and possibly some of these other uh, pieces as well um, and still have the power to regulate plastic bags. Um, Donna, just to follow okay, up. That was the whole sentence that I liked. The, the, that is okay. all one sentence, believe it or not. Oh, you're right. It is all one <laughs> sentence. Okay. So you like the rest of it. Yes, yeah, so we may have to talk longer on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yes, Ashley. So I echo Rosie's concern, and I think it could just be, for me, the placement of the within the city. Um, if we put that in a different place, I think that would, would make much more clear exactly what it is we are trying to do and why. Um, commas are significant in these things, and um, I just, I think, I think I'm inclined to agree about the negative impacts to wildlife. I, mm, um, but I think that it's really, for me, this charter change is about um, the, the, the plastic bag issue and, and other sort of single-use plastics. Um, and I, I know that those have an impact on wildlife, but if we are trying to get the state to approve a charter change, I think we need to be as exacting as possible in that language. Um, and so as with the understanding from Bill that we have the ability to tailor that, sort of understanding what's on the line, I, what I don't want to do is be in a position where we put this up knowing that there's sort of no conceivable way that the legislature will approve it without sort of that narrowing that happens. Um, I would be comfortable voting right now to get that language to the city clerk and then working as a council through that and, you know, and coming with proposals to the to the meeting then to make sure that we kind of get the most exacting language that we can make that a reality. Um, Connor and Jack. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm saying the same thing. I'd be hesitant to strike anything without hearing the rationale for why it was included in the first place. So if we get another bite at the apple, I'd be inclined just to approve it tonight. Thank you. Um, Jack. Um, the one thing that uh, I want to ask Rosie to clarify something. Um, you, you would still support keeping that last sentence, the sentence that starts out in furtherance thereof, right? Because that's the one that gives us the, ch uh, the chance to collect uh, taxes and fees, fees taxes. Yes, okay. yeah. I, I think I, as I was reading this, and I apologize, Ann, because you said, showed this to me a week or two ago, and I, I didn't focus it as much as I could have. Uh, I was sort of playing out in my mind, well, what happens if this is in the committee in the legislature, and they're saying, well, we kind of like part of this, but at that point, we don't really have the ability to negotiate with the legislature because what's, what we pass is what we pass. 
Um, so, so I think it's worth uh, talking about how how we can tailor this. So, the, and they do have the power to amend it, um, and the. Most recent thinking has been that they wouldn't change it substantively, but if there are tweaks that they need to make, then that they have the power to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um. But so that said, what I would I move that we uh, adopt this as is for uh, discussion uh, at the October third meeting, and uh, it's not part of the motion, but my suggestion is that we'll be discussing it the language so, so if you could the motion would actually be that you move to file this language okay. with the city clerk okay i'll second so we're filing language with the city clerk that's this and then we can have further discussion about it okay so it was seconded and further discussion <coughs> just that i won't be here we're putting a lot in that agenda okay. um yes so i just want to clarify if uh we can't come to a an agreement on that at that point about what we want this language to look like where does that leave us That's a great question because I'm willing to support it you know basically if it's a motion to have a further discussion later that's fine yeah but I don't want to support it if there's a risk that this is what we actually file you all still have to approve the warning you can yeah. just leave it off I, yeah I don't it's all on that day it's on October. yeah yeah I mean there'll be something that four people put their hands up for okay. well unless for if Don is gone and if you don't agree if you don't have four votes you won't be on the ballot well, you need to vote. Mm -hmm. i oh, mean yeah. that's what it comes down to yeah. if you, okay you need four okay just because you file the language you still have to vote to put it on the ballot. <laughs> that's, that's what i was asking so. okay okay um great uh oh we haven't voted yet <laughs> okay so um any further discussion on favor please say aye. Aye. aye aye opposed great thank you thank you for bearing with us okay Back to you, Emerald Ashbor. Take it away. Um, so as I was saying, we had worked with them. I'm sorry that this wasn't in with your material. I'm not sure why that is. We certainly thought we'd uploaded it. It was in this up. But anyway, we'll check the techni technology on that. But this is the list. As you can see, they've given this a lot of thought. Um, and it all seems reasonable, and it, none of it um, puts us into any kind of commitment position beyond, you know, going into next year's budget, which was my concern. And this uh, could start uh, any time, potentially, I just want to make sure that we are going to be able to implement this by, the, by May. Tomorrow <laughs> morning, they'll be out branch <laughs> sampling and... Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Ash Ashley, and then did you have your hand? Yeah, okay. Um, so I am supportive of this. Um, I want to, a couple of things. One, do you think that this addresses the most pressing needs? Does this prioritize the things that are like most critical right now? I'm seeing some nods. Okay. Um, additionally, I see that you are looking for interns, yes. which is very exciting. Um, I teach at CCV and have for years, and there is always a pool of interns who are looking for stuff and things to do, um, potentially in this vein. So I would encourage you, feel free to reach out to me in my other capacity, um, and, and we can get that sort of started. But also Norwich University and a few other places around. Yes, UVM, yes. Sterling Great. College. Uh, Rosie. Great. Um, so I'm just a little bit confused about the additional 12,000 that's needed and where that's coming from. It would be come from our fund balance, our general okay. reserves. And we have that available. Donna, did you have? Is your statement here about training and working with DPW, is that a reality? Do they actually have bodies that are well, extra? So the propose how I proposed it to Tom McCardle and Brian Tuttle, sheep advisor, is if there was times of year like between plowing and streets like November, December, where we weren't getting snow, if they if it was possible that they you know they knew a couple ahead, days ahead of time that they might have a couple uh, guys that would be uh, they could free up for us to use for some tree work. <coughs> that kind of a thing not not that they would give us two days a week through the year because I, I know they can't do that um, well 
there's uh, there's uh, inventory. They they wouldn't be involved in inventory work. That would that would be an intern and staff. Inventory work. Okay, that's listed here. That's all. With with the, with the with the with the EPW. Okay. okay. Yeah. That 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 might happen with branch sampling and pruning because that can happen at the same time. You right. can go along a neighborhood and do pruning and do branch sampling when you come to ash. So they could be involved in that kind of. Uh, thing and then updating the inventory as you go, but the systematic uh, inventory that would likely not occur till spring again, um, uh, that would be best done by park staff and the intern who is trained with park staff to do that very type of thing, and that would not be as efficient with DPW. What would be efficient with DPW in doing this, if this worked, is because they often are doing work along city streets, and if there was a couple guys who had the training that could actually help, it would actually help in a synergistic well for them to, way to be able to do a professional pruning because right now they don't have the training so they often leave stubs that we have to come back and hit a second time which isn't as efficient as if someone was trained to do it uh, properly. Now I've also talked with, uh, and I'm not sure if we run in trouble with unions uh, and I haven't, Tom was th uh, thought it might be a good idea but I haven't had a conversation with Brian Tuttle, so I'm not sure how realistic that is. Um, and of course, it's all weather depending. You know, we might get a lot of help, or it might be a really snowy winter, and we might not get any help. But the rec department talked with Arnie. He hasn't talked with Rick, but it also there's another possibility of doing something similar with the rec department. Uh, again, offering a stipend when they have free time and in between seasons, sending so somebody feel, with us. Even without putting a specific person on inventory. I guess I thought the adult four was a real issue this fall and that there needed to be someone out there. No. no. Spring. Spring. April, soon enough. Okay, Spring is for, for that part. Is good. Great. <coughs> so I assume we probably, oh, any further questions? Public. Um, I uh, assume that we need a motion to approve this twenty thousand dollars. I'll make a motion that we approve the twelve thousand dollar budget as outlined and presented by the tree board staff. Yeah, it's a twenty thousand dollar budget. It's eight thousand plus, plus twelve. Eight, eight that was already set aside. The use 20, of the eight from sorry. the reserve sorry. and the 20, twelve 000. from the general reserve. Yeah, that's the thing about taking your class at all. <laughs> twenty thousand. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Glad Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Else. That's very helpful. Okay, so that is the end of our regular business. Um, so uh, on to council reports. Uh, we'll do all that and then go into executive session. Uh, who would like to start? I'll pass. Oh, okay. I'm also passing. I will also pass. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm not <laughs> passing, <laughs> but I'll be brief. Um, first, just that I've been excited recently uh, to see the physical changes downtown with the removal of a couple of uh, buildings right next to where I work and filings going in for the transit center. Um, that's all uh, really personally <coughs> entertaining and also uh, encouraging to, to see that really getting started. Um, and I'm, I'm enjoying uh, trying to see all of the projects together as much as I can and, and kind of um, further out into the streets and sidewalks and intersections. I went to the uh, Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee's uh, scoping study presentation a couple of weeks back. It feels like ages ago, August 29th, uh, and it was great. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to what comes out of that process as well. I think that there's, there have been uh, a lot of unnecessary friction points um, through downtown that, that I think we may be able to deal with, especially, for example, the, the Barry and Main Street uh, intersection. So all of that is kind of connected in my mind, and I'm enjoying watching it uh, change. Um, and as usual, I'll be at Baguito's tomorrow morning 
8.30 to 9.30. Uh, and I look forward to seeing anyone there to talk about that and everything else. I'll pass. I would like to uh, unfortunately pass on a complaint that Rosie and I got that we had a complaint about late construction noises on the French block. We're talking about 1030 and later welders and such and also about the dumpster. So maybe we can have a conversation uh, about that. She said she's tried to talk to people about it, but <coughs> it's an issue. And uh, likewise, though, I do want to appreciate out loud and, and refer people to your PowerPoint that you presented on the city par parking garage this last week. It was very good. And people should go on and look at that spreadsheets, the graphs, the information. I think it can cover a lot, a lot, a lot of questions. It's well done, Bill. Thank you. I, w I would caution people that some, some of that PowerPoint just had questions that I then answered verbally. So I'll probably have to convert those and actually put the answers to the questions on them, too. I think the n next bridge article will probably be those questions and answers. But just so if you're looking and you see a couple of pages of just questions, there were answers. That <laughs> the <laughs> graphs were very good on it. expenses and revenue. Yeah. Thank you. Sounds like you've been fielding some questions. No, just she had mentioned, okay. I saw Donna at the Rotary the other day on the same topic. Uh, and okay. She said something about my PowerPoint. And you asked if it was on the website. And then afterwards, I walked off. I said, oh, someone will go and just see a bunch of questions. Like <laughs> these PowerPoints will be on the website, right? Yeah, I mean, they're just great. <coughs> um, so I want to gauge people's interest. I know the last time um, I, I had a council report, I mentioned, you know, is there interest in citywide compost? Um, I just want to mention that there is a grant out there through the Center for Mont Solid Waste District um, t that could potentially fund a study um, to look at our, some options. And I think if we um, want to go down that route at all, it would be good to have some information. Um, and so I just want to gauge your interest. Um, is it worthwhile to have um, so you write a, a grant to that end? And uh, w this is not necessarily an approval of that, right? Like they would come back to us with, um, with a, a grant um, and we could approve it. It, it would be official then. Got, I've got some nods. Rosie's. I'm a little skeptical just because currently the state law does require that the commercial haulers um, start providing domestic pickup um, in 2020. So I don't want us to spend too much. I know that there's a potential that maybe the legislature rolls that back or it gets pushed back further. But I don't want us to spend too many resources you know, planning for something that we sure. may not need to do. Um, if it's not a matching grant, if it's a like, they'll give us all the money for it, um, <laughs> I would be more interested. Okay. Um, I also, you and I had talked about yes. the fact that city buildings are going to need to comply with the compost law, and I might be more interested in directing our efforts on <laughs> that route because that's also something we're going to need to deal with. Mm. Um, we should definitely be looking into that for sure. Um, I saw nods over here. The thoughts? I, I would support it, looking at it sort of generally. I think if one of our goals is to be much more conscious about sort of the, the waste that we produce as a community, we have a community garden space. I mean, there might be ways where, sure, haulers are obligated to pick it up, but what as a city can we be doing mm -hmm. to, you know, for folks who don't have trash service? Like, what, what else are we offering as a community? Um, actually, I should be clear, too. So um, I know Lucas Herring and the Barry Council has been um, talking a little bit about this, but they're also talking um, in general about uh, the, the, uh, the possibility of um, doing all three, uh, trash recycling and compost. And I, I think, you know, it, as long as we're, if, it, if it's not a matching grant, right, then I don't think it hurts for us to ask for a comparison of, you know, is it better to just do compost or there are efficiencies if we did all three? And I, again, it doesn't obligate us to anything, but having information, I think, would be useful. Um, so, any further thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, Jack, yeah, um, In the town I grew up in, in, in northern New Jersey, most of the, that area, uh, municipalities do garbage collection, yeah. just as part of the uh, city services. Are, are you thinking that that would be the plan? Well, I'm not, I mean, I'm going to speak for myself here, right? Like, I'm not particularly interested in uh, getting the city specifically <laughs> involved in uh, waste hauling. Um, 
but uh, I, I could picture that as a possibility that we could have some kind of a contract with Center Vermont Solid Waste District, and they could be the contract holders and go, you know, go through the process of um, putting it out to bid and, you know, changing, uh, you know, providers if there was a problem and fielding plates and that kind of thing, uh, but that we might, you know, be a vehicle for that. That's a thought. Again, it's not, we're not obligating ourselves, so. I'm really not interested in that. Okay. No, that's fair. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, I think that's, that's it for me. Uh, just a reminder that water bills are due on the 15th, which I guess is a Saturday, so it'll be that Monday. Um, <laughs> also, in case people are curious about the status of the other charter change, which you know, it was coming from petition, so you all didn't need to, to approve to send that language to me. The language has been in my office for some time, but just to punctuate that, I actually received uh, most of the petitions today. So that language was handed to me with signatures on it. Um, I've only gone through and verified about 210, 220 of the signatures. I think as it stands right now, it's going to need about, it's going to need 302, 303. Um, based on the quality of the signatures, and I know there's more out there, I have no reason to believe that they're not going to make the threshold in plenty of time, so. How long do they have to do that? Uh, they have until the 20th to do that, so plenty of time. Um, and if you all are curious, too, I also got a look at the, um, the you know, Winooski's language, which is quite different and has very different um, uh, sort of implications and to it. Um, I could mention or you could talk to me. Just one minor correction to something you just said. Actually, the, the water bills are due on the Saturday, either postmarked or in the drop box. They're not extended till Monday. Oh, they are. So, so people don't come in late and blame you oh. on television. Really? <laughs> that hasn't always been the case. That hasn't been how we always did it, though. Did you have a question, Stephen? Well, As yeah, I, I really want to protest formally that I, I, I haven't been able to hear half of what's been going on tonight. I really can't. I, there's nothing wrong with my hearing. Yeah. These mics are just useless. I see you've moved them. I still, you know, I don't know what he's doing with the levels, but, you know, yeah. well, it's and, not working. And this you know system, they're closer. You've still got to be on this end. Of the you need to change these mics. Yeah. They're just no good. Speaker's point in that way. I'm sorry. I'm hey, no, that's, thank you. That's it's, it's uh, uh, useful feedback. Time problem. Yep, for sure. So I'm, I'm sorry. We'll thank we'll uh, have some further conversation about that. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, the, and for those listening at home, the comment was that it's really hard to hear. So <laughs> we'll, we will talk more about that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, well, I don't have a lot um, other than what's in the weekly memo. I will say that um, as we work through the various items, just so I know this is something we've been talking about, we actually have a big group effort planned for Friday afternoon to do ordinance review. We've got our manager's staff, we've got the city attorney, police chief, and we're blocked out the whole afternoon. We're going up to the city attorney's office and we're going to start plowing through as much of the book as we can get to. So. Um, it hasn't been forgotten for those that had it on the list. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, and one other point. This is also just a, a, a minor thing, but over the, we've had some questions over the years, not, not sound system things, but uh, over the last year or so, about different technology that could be used, like C-Click Fix and some other things to, to track requests and those kind of things. So uh, we'll be attending next week or so, um, a national conference for city managers, and I've flagged the vendors that do that, so I'll be making a special effort to talk to them directly about the services and if they're feasible for us. So that's another, another one we're following up on. Okay. Um, so I think we need to go into executive session to do a city manager check-in. I move we go into executive session pursuant to 1 VSA 313 a3 to discuss the appointment or employment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee. Second. Further discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 
and we will not be coming back.